We'd like to thank the Austrian Trade Commission, and particularly Franks Rössler, as well as the Austrian Consul General in Chicago, Consul Thomas Schnell, for generally supporting the reception this morning, or this, this afternoon. I'm glad, I hope you all enjoyed it. That was very nice. Thank you for the Austrian wines and the cheese. <laughs> so many of you are members of the Council, but um, in case you're not, we would encourage you to join. The membership starts at about $80 per year, and it entitles you to reduce pro pricing for over 150 programs a year. We've got a couple of great upcoming programs. Um, tomorrow morning, we have a public program with the, a briefing with the PLO Chief Representative of the United States, His Excellency Maine Rashid Arakat. Um, tomorrow at lunchtime, we're hosting the Spanish Ambassador, um, Jorge Descazar de Mazaredo. He is the Ambassador of Spain to the US, and he'll be talking about what's happening in Europe at the moment. And then on December 13th, Professor Fawaz Gurgis is coming in from London to talk about the Arab world's Berlin Wall moment. So I'll be back up for Q&A, but now I'd like you to welcome um, with me Ryan Kramer, who is a principal at Masuda, Funai, Eifert, and Mitchell in Chicago, and he'll introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. King. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As Ms. King had indicated, uh, I am Reinhold Kramer. Uh, I'm a principal and director with the law firm here in Chicago called Masuda Funai Eifert and Mitchell. Um, I, with my clients and colleagues, many of which are here tonight, um, are very excited to hear Dr. Leitl's uh, insights and perspectives. And on behalf of the um, Chicago Council on Global Affairs, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, tonight we are delighted um, to welcome Dr. Christoph Leitl. Uh, he's the president of the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber. He's also a very experienced leader in European business community, and he's an accomplished academic. Dr. Leitl will present uh, a very timely discussion on the future of business in Europe. As you know, Europe is in a political and economic turning point and crossroads. Decisions made by Europeans Policymakers in the coming hours, days, weeks, and months will have global re repercussions. As the rest of the world focuses the majority of its attention on the events, such as the fate of the euro and ultimately uh, the EU itself, less attention and discourse has been devoted to the individual companies in Europe. It is worth noting that small and medium-sized enterprises in Europe constitute approximately 99% of all entities. Think about that. These companies have benefited for years from the transactional conveniences of open borders and a common currency in Europe. As a consequence, these companies have been deeply affected by the recent crisis of faith in both European political and financial institutions. Un uncertain times like these which are presently faced present both challenges and opportunities to seize for European companies. And these are some of the issues we look forward to hearing and having Dr. Leitl address tonight. By way of brief introduction, Dr. Leitl is the current president of the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber, the most influential organization in Austria. Uh, with respect to businesses, he is the former president of Euro Chambers, the Association of European Chambers of Commerce and Industry, which currently represents 20 million enterprises in Europe through 46 national and transnational chamber organizations and a network of regional and local chambers. Dr. Lytle also serves in academic positions at Princeton, Shanghai, Cape Town, Istanbul, and Vienna. At this time, I'd like everybody to welcome Dr. Lytle. Dr. Lytle. Thank you, Mr. Kramer, Madame Niem, uh, dear members of uh, Chicago Council and dear members of Consular Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me uh, that you are spending your time uh, today at this meeting. Uh, and. Uh, Many of you were asking me, is it for the first time you are here? Uh, no, ladies and gentlemen, it's for the second time. The first time was 40 years ago. 
I was traveling uh, by Greyhound with, <laughs> as a student, $99. <laughs> From New York, uh, San Francisco, New Orleans, Washington, back, and Chicago was the first impressive station. <laughs> and congratulations. Uh, a city that works is your motto, and in the few hours I'm here, I can assure you, that's right, a city that works. And a city with a lot of sympathy and uh, admiration. And uh, uh, we are feeling extremely well here. And uh, uh, the people we met, uh, I think it's, it's not only the heart of America, Chicago. It's also the heart in the emotions, a real America, a real emotion, a compassion. And that's, I wanted to congratulate you. Uh, but uh, I also met a few fellow Austrians who are here for years and decades. And they became real citizens of Chicago. But I want to address them today also in their mother tongue. Liebe Landsleute, liebe Österreichische, ich freue mich sehr, dass ich bei euch bin. Ich bin stolz auf euch, was ihr gemacht habt, wie ihr hier lebt, wie ihr euch einbringt. Ich wünsche euch alles Gute und grüße euch herzlich von eurer Heimat Österreich. As Austrian, I have at first expressed my gratitude. Express my gratitude. We Austrians never forget the help of American citizens and American people after World War II, the Marshall Plan aid. It was one of the most wise decisions ever made to help in a difficult situation and to protect in this way against communism. And the greatest success was not only the economic cooperation, the cooperation on the basis of common values and orientation and perspective, but also the successes overwhelming the communism and now shaping globalization. And by shaping globalization, we are relying on our common values. And I think in this time of globalization and global responsibility, these values are valid more than ever before. I'm aware of that. And therefore, we always have to ask ourselves, what can we do together to respond to the challenges we are facing and to bear the responsibility we have? I think United States and European Union are sharing a similar position. The financial crisis was hitting the real economy in United States as well as in European Union. Companies and private persons had many difficulties and many losses. I think at the middle classes here in America as well as in Europe. The growth decreased, consumers and investors lost confidence, 
the public debts were raising up because of the necessity of securing the financial system on the one hand and on the other hand pushing economy in US as well as in European Union. The unemployment rate was increasing in your country as well as in Europe, close to 10%. And in Europe, the youth unemployment in some countries has reached a degree where it's making great sorrows to me because youth unemployment is causing instability, protests, and sometimes aggression. And we have to be very much aware of this development. And when I spoke from values and responsibility, then it's for our young people with highest priority. We have similar a uh, similar situation also in political governance. European Union has a lack of leadership. We have too many authorities the president of the council, the president of the Eurozone, the president of the commission, the president of the parliament, and perhaps there is another president, I don't know. <laughs> I hope they do know. But also, I have a little bit concern about the political situation in your country, which I'm admiring. But the sorrow is the political blockade. In former times, there was a center in the politics which was able to make compromises and find common solutions. When today a president is blocked, um, by an ideologic behavior, uh, then it's not good for the development in the global aspect. We are not only in a competition in economic respects, we also are in a competition of governance. Who is able in times of so lot of changes to act and to react fast and find solutions. I think we have to think over that and to influence because it's a matter of surviving of democratic systems vis-a-vis -vis other points of governance. Yes, and uh, when I speak from similar situation, I want also to mention climate change and the demographic challenges we are facing. Okay, that was the common position. But the United States and European Union are also sharing common possibilities and I think by working closer together. Possibilities and future perspectives, the main thing is education, bettering skills, skilled workers. We are all lacking. Uh, we in Austria, we have a, a special education for skilled workers. We have won the European Championship in the competition of skills, the oil skills, because our companies with apprenticeship 
is working on that and accompanying young people between 15 and 18 and uh, educating them to real high qualified professionals. And if you have the skills, you have the quality, and the quality is the basis for successful competition. And skills are the basis for innovation. And we need growth by innovation, not speculation. And when we are visiting tomorrow MIT in Boston, nanotechnology, biotechnology, energy, today here in Chicago, you know what I'm meaning. We have to focus on certain fields and become the best of the world in these fields. And I think we have a better chance to become the best by cooperation. Because we fit together in the priorities, in the strategies, and in the measures. Next, we are sharing and the possibility means free trade. Yes, we have in the European Union an internal market. It's uh, one of our highest priorities. But uh, we have to deepen it in the fields of energy, services, labor market. And I am suggesting, together with the American Chamber of Commerce and Industry, my friend Tom Danayu is president. A free trade agreement between the United States and the European Union that doesn't exist. We should build a zero tariff zone. No tariffs and no tariff barriers. That would give also an impulse for the Doha round and would cause an extra growth of 4% within only five years. $180 billion. Why should we miss this huge chance? Let's work on it. The next possibility is the so-called G20. There is an enormous chance for global governance, but you have to use a chance. Only to have a chance is too less. We need financial reforms and better financial regulation to avoid financial crashes to reduce speculation and bubbles. We all had suffered in the past. We have to learn the lessons and make better conditions in the future. And therefore, it's my, as, as chairman of the Global Chamber Platform, I try to bring the business of all parts of the world together and address the politicians in the G20. And in the G20, we can work together, Europe and United States. Europe, the four major countries are represented there. The European Union itself and the United States. We are together six out of 20. You can influence this strategy. We should, next point, discuss the financial transaction tax. I know that's in discussion in your country. The majority till now is against. 
but a strong and growing minority is pro. Why I am pro a financial transaction tax? Not as kind of punishment. They caused some troubles and therefore they have to pay for it. No. I'm for the integration also for the financial service sex sector in the regular tax system. That means a kind of solidarity and contribution that not all tax burdens are in the real economy, also in the financial sector. And therefore contributing to reduce debt, to finance our public budget, or to contribute to investments in research, in development, and other things, infrastructure, for example. Yes, and the next point is to reduce currency imbalances. I think the cooperation between the Fed and the ECB should be strengthened. And together with uh, the federal banks of China and Japan, we should have some balances which is positive influencing the real economy. And now I want to answer your question out of all the questions. It's will the euro collapse? you will get a clear answer. N no, it won't. Look at the relation of euro to dollar. Does a weak currency look like this? There's an Austrian proverb. Those who are announced to be dead live longest. But now seriously, what's the ca causing of the turbulences? Very simple. A common currency needs also a common economic policy. And a common currency needs also fiscal discipline. We in Europe didn't have both. The creators of the common currency expected that the common economic policy will follow. It didn't. And the fiscal discipline was agreed but never controlled and never sanctioned. And therefore, without any effect. These are the mistakes we made, and these are the mistakes we have to correct. We have only the possibility to swim together or to sink alone. That means, what have we to do? First point, fiscal and financial consolidation. Europeans at this moment are sitting together and negotiating. Secure liquidity for the financial system. We have the European stability mechanism and are prepared. Um, ECB could learn a lot from the Fed. I think you gave the right answer. And the European fears of causing inflation, if I look at the figures, 
in the United States, I see no reason for extra fears. We need normal lending of the banks with the, with the companies, access to finance also for small and medium-sized enterprises. We need the banking sector recapitalized. Basel III was negotiated between in the Basel Club between Americans and Europeans, but Americans now are rather reluctant to implement it. Uh, Basel II, Europe marched on, and now we say, oh, America goes ahead. It, or we are making it in a European kind. But it's, if we want to secure the international financial system, we have to cooperate in this field. Otherwise, there is a danger to fail. I personally am very in favor for euro bonds. The fragmented bond market is no help in this situation. But I'm for differentiated interest rates within the bonds. Those who are in the best category have to pay the lowest interest rates. And those who have problems have to pay higher interest rates. But they are outside of speculation. And speculation is always focusing on one or two or a few countries. And that would be the chance to say, OK, you have no chance because there is a community. And bonds is an instrument for the community. And in this connection, let's discuss also the role of rating agencies. What are they doing? <laughs> and which liability do they have? when they are making mistakes, we have to discuss it. Naturally, we have to reduce also public deficits and debts by restructuring and regaining confidence of financial investors. Ladies and gentlemen, some are saying US are watching Euro problems with sympathy, and waiting for collapsing. I am telling them. The trade volume of the United States with Europe is $4 trillion. And the investment of Americans in European companies is $1 trillion. And so I'm telling to my citizen fellows, do you really think Americans want to risk that and lose their biggest foreign market? The answer is clear. And I think we have a common interest that the euro will survive, but more than that, I am convinced that the European Union will be strengthened come out from this crisis. And the European Union will be developed in the direction of more community, more Europe, not less Europe, more than a collection of 27 members. I think after consolidation of this situation, there are next steps of integration. 
I think at Croatia, Serbia, Macedonia, they are waiting. They are part of the European family. We have to adopt them. And more than that, I have a personal vision. That means an economic area including Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, and the Mediterranean area. In a European economic area, not political one, not European Union in enlargement, but economic integration. <coughs> One common market with one billion people that would a contribution to prosperity and stability and gives also a lot of chances for our American partners. In summary of our goals, We need a closer union and better governance. We need financial stability and fiscal discipline. And we need sustainable growth with job creation. And with these three pillars, Europe will continue to be a reliable partner to other countries and continents, particular to our American friends and partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was great to hear your perspective on um, this. So now we'd like to go out to the audience for a few questions. If you wouldn't mind raising your arm and waiting for a microphone, that'd be terrific. Yeah, right up here in the third row, please. Mr. Lytle, an easy question. <laughs> How do you want to give up any uh, tariffs between countries in the EU as well as towards uh, other countries like the United States. Politically, how is that possible? Peter, yeah. I, to answer, to answer uh, questions very professionally, I have some experts here with me. <laughs> <laughs> he is uh, a leader of my Department of European Affairs. Mr. Mandel, please. Okay. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think the tariffs between the United States and Europe are not very high anymore. It's about 2, 2.5% in average. And to reduce this to zero does mean no protection anymore. Uh, and so if you reduce by 2.5%, what does it matter? But it helps to boost the economy in both economies. Only, I think, agriculture could be a problem. And the non-tariff. Uh, non-tariff barriers, barriers, yeah. You have already yeah. some discussion about non-tariff yeah. barriers in the Transatlantic Economic Council. And uh, in some respects, you have already uh, the uh, bilateral agreements concerning mutual agreement on the technical side. OK. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, next question. Um, in the back there, somebody has their arm up? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Um, I was reading in a foreign policy magazine that a potential free trade agreement between the EU and the United States would constitute a sort of protectionist um, idea of trying to keep, instead of, like free trade agreements, they sound so great in theory, but really the, the they add preferential treatment and, treat and trade in general. So how would you, what would, I guess, can you just elaborate more on, on this potential EU-US free trade agreement? I guess I'm confused. 
where will is there is a way. And uh, I think, I think, when we are discussing things one decade, WTO, and making no progress, and the next door around will, and uh, it's an easy prediction, bring no substantial progress. We have to discuss other ways, bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements, and we, here we need initiatives. And this special agreement and the special free trade zone between United States and Europe could be a good signal. Yes, we are ready, we are able, and we are willing, working together, and hoping that others will uh, enter this free trade zone. That should not be a club of two. Uh, should be new, not be a new monopole. It should be open to others, and in this way, perhaps uh, um, uh, make progress that WTO will come to an end. Okay. Next question. Yes, right here, please. I found your, uh, your vision for uh, Europe really admirable. It's a, it's a great vision. How do you see uh, that vision um, realized in the absence of the, uh, the UK being part of the Eurozone? Yeah. Um, UK is not member of the Eurozone. It's member of the European Union. Uh, but I think... Uh, uh, to stand outside has some advantages, but I think more disadvantages. And uh, uh, I think the uh, financial situation of Great Britain is not the best one. Um, we are in Europe now discussing which way to go. All 27 to agree in a common strategy or only the 17 members of the Eurozone? Um, we will solve this question in a very practical manner. If there is a consensus of the 27, all 27 are integrated. But if some are saying, no, we want not to participate, OK, stay outside but don't hinder the others. We will not force you, but you will not hinder us. That will be the way. And uh, at minimum, the 17 have to agree because they have the currency and they have that what we need behind the currency, uh, a common, more common uh, philosophy, a more common strategy, more common measures with controlling, with sanctions, with obligations, and therefore, now in these days, we will di uh, is discussed: is this a changing of treaties? Changing of treaties is rather difficult, because you have to make ratification and all parliaments, and 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 it ta takes a long time. Uh, the better way is the other to make formal agreements, which are obliging you, uh, but. I'm not uh, uh, an expert on, in treaties. I'm a practical-oriented businessman. Uh, perhaps is that the difference. But anyway, um, we have to go with those who are willing, uh, going to the um, to the uh, to the right in the right way, because if you are asking for solidarity. You have to have also a behavior that you have a right of solidarity. And that's what we have in future to make better than in the past. Thanks. Yeah, next question right up here. Ked Fairbank, please. Thank you very much for your comments this evening. I, I was interested in your talk about the um, inclusion of Russia, Serbia, Croatia, and a billion-person billion market. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand 
all of the mathematics involved in getting from a little under 400 million to a billion, but do you see that as well as, as, as a lever in terms of competition with the eastern countries which are growing and have uh, such massive population as well, creating a larger market with a larger demand base? Certainly it's a future uh, vision, but if you see uh, European Union with high competence in the fields of technology and feeling as a European state, Russia and Ukraine, with European culture, uh, with European history, um, with a lot of needs of that competences and know-how and the other way around. Uh, Russia, a giant market, now becoming member of WTO with the support of United States and European Union, which will make Russia uh, much more stable and uh, I think it's an advantage for us too. And with a lot of uh, raw materials and energy. And that fits together, that would stabilize that. Ukraine nearly the same. Turkey the same in an advanced level. But you know we have a lot of discussions. Is it possible in this situation and after an enlargement uh, in, in uh, this dimension to pick up a huge country like Turkey, it would, um, it would be a great risk, not for Turkey, also for the European Union. The European Union, uh, all 10 be, uh, till 15 years, uh, adopted two or three additional members in the history of European unification. And then, after the fall of Iron Curtain, all these, in a window of opportunity, you, you didn't know what's coming in the next years, they were here, and the so-called Big Bang, that was the accession of 10 countries in 05, and additional two countries, Romania, Bulgaria in 07. 12 countries plus, nearly doubling the members. And now Croatia and Serbia, okay, you can afford that. But a huge country, not. And therefore we have to make longer perspectives. We don't know how is the situation in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years. How will they develop? But you have them integrate in that field. We are able to work together. And I think Russia has economic power. Turkey, strong economic power will have in the next five years uh, the uh, highest growth rate among all OECD countries. And then the Mediterranean area. We have to wait what the political uh, situation, Arabic Spring. But then afterwards, we have to stabilize them in our interest. I will not address the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is a permanent threat for, 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 for peace in the world. And to integrate them in economic respect would be a giant step. And it's my experience that economy is going ahead and politics is following. And therefore, my optimism that this could work, there is no guarantee, 
naturally, no guarantee, but a chance. And we should try it. Yeah. Uh, right behind Vito, thanks. You pointed out earlier in your remarks that the United States has difficulties with different branches of government. The president has difficulty getting things done. If you have 17 or 27 different countries, the press is reporting that maybe Friday is a deadline that Merkel and Sarkozy are imposing on making these decisions, whether it'll be 17 or 27. Can it be done that fast? And if so, you said the treaties legally take a long time, but can the political decisions be made that fast, the agreements be reached? And if it can be, is that a sign that things are in very dire circumstances? All 27 members have to be integrated in the decision, yes. But the European unification process was always led and steered uh, by two countries, France, and Germany. After two terrible world wars, always uh, uh, brought to an end by US intervention with many victims also in this country here. The lesson for Europeans was that the two great countries struggling together, fighting against each, each other, should become to a point of friendship and an animosity. And the more members you have, the more important, important will be the lead function not to overrule the others, but to bring suggestions and the signal, yes, we too agree, and please let's discuss now in the greater forum. Mm -hmm. And if we want to overwhelm that, and in the future we should, then we need to reduce the influence of the European Council, that's the gathering of the uh, presidents and prime ministers, that means the top um, responsibilities and responsibility bearers of the member countries, reduce it and to raise the competences of Commission and Parliament. That will in a, let's say, within one decade be a possible development. But in the short time, especially in a time of crisis, you can't have a discussion among 27. You have to have leadership. If, if a house is burning, you need a command, and all others are helping. Um, but that's not a normal situation. That's a situation to avoid damage and crisis. And therefore, I'm in favor for this situation, but knowing that's not a, a future perspective, the future perspective will be more rights for commission, less for council. Okay, yeah, next question, the gentleman with the glasses in the middle. Uh, thank you, uh, enjoyed your remarks tonight, thank you very much. Um, Austrian banks have exposure in Eastern Europe uh, equal to approximately Austria's GDP. Um, is that starting to affect your chamber members' uh, access to capital with those banks? And do you see that uh, Merkel and Sarkozy's uh, proposed treaty changes uh, uh, 
affecting the risks to the Austrian banking system? The so-called exposure of the banks in Central and Eastern Europe are not specific Austrian ones. Yes, through our neighborhood, our exposure is a little bit uh, uh, more than others, but German banks, French banks, Italian banks are involved also. I have not, so, no, not sorrows in that way because the, this money was not invested in speculation. It was invested in projects which are of greatest necessity for these countries. And therefore, I think this is not the point also for the rating agencies and others. This is not the point. Another point is, and the access to finance is much more influenced uh, by Basel III, core capital, but also bank levies on the other hand. Um, and therefore they, they have to, if, if you have to more equity, core capital, the less you can finance the real economy uh, and the more you have to pay interest if you need loans. And that's the point I'm focusing. That's the point which is influencing growth. Uh, I think the Central and Eastern European countries in the European Union, they have two perspectives. First, their growth rate will be double of the Western part. And second, with the cohesion force, the solidarity force, the richer pay in and the poorer get out, with this cohesion force, they get a lot of money for infrastructure projects and environmental protection projects. And that means that these countries in the next years will have economic progress and therefore accompanying by banks of Austria, of France, of Italy, of Germany is a, for, for me, very natural, natural thing. And uh, I think that's not a reason to have concerns. Yeah, um, next question over here, the, the gentleman in the middle of the row. Back a little. Yeah, thanks. I was just curious about, is there an unemployment rate in Austria or the European common market or anywhere else? Yes, the unemployment rate differs. Austria is in a lucky situation to be the best. Uh, in, in positive manners, yes. <laughs> um, uh, about uh, 4%. 4% uh, percent, uh, percent. Uh, European rate is 8 to 9%. That means similar to US. That shows, but on the other hand, that within the European Union there are great differences. In Spain, you have nearly 50% of youth unemployment and a general unemployment rate of uh, 20 plus X. And that's it, what we should, should uh, see with concerns, uh, especially the youth unemployment. I mentioned it before. 
you cannot have stability if you give young people no chance and no perspective. That's the core point, the core point. And we as representatives of business communities, we have to think how to do it, how to manage it. We have a lack of skilled people around the world. But we have unemployed people, often without skills. Therefore, education, I mentioned it also before, education is a, a key word in this situation. Uh, Austria and other countries are in a better situation, but in the European community, we are facing nearly the same problems as you in the United States. And we have to, to work together. We have so many similarities in the frame conditions. We have to work together and find solution and learn from each other. That's all what I can say to that. Right. Um, next question right here, please. A lot of the problems of the Euro and the Eurozone would be solved if Europe, if Europe could start growing again. Uh, faster than it is now. What do you think might drive Europe's growth uh, in the near future? Um, the forecasts are about 2.5% this year, about 0.5% uh, uh, next year, and one5 in uh, in the in the year afterwards, that means uh, this um, uh, this growth is too less uh, to influence unemployment rate, and therefore all countries. Your president is focusing on that growth to get better employment will be a very decisive issue in the incoming year in your country, uh, in Europe too. And we have to ask ourselves, how can we manage more growth? We in Austria, we say, okay, we have to go outside. 60% uh, of our uh, prosperity we are earning outside the Austrian borders in the European Union and outside in the overseas. America, a wonderful partner, thank you very much. China, racing, uh, Arabic countries, racing, Russia, racing, India, racing, Brazil, uh, Latin America, uh, Mexico, and then, and, and. and therefore we are focusing in these, in these increasing markets. And uh, Austria Chamber of Commerce and Industry is not only representation of interest vis-a-vis -vis the government, no, much more. The biggest uh, uh, service company of Austria, uh, because uh, the education, as I mentioned, innovation, um, uh, creation of enterprises, uh, contribution in labor ma mar market uh, services, uh, and the foreign trade organization is managed and financed by the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. That means we are not only demanding with the visa mm -hmm. public, we are delivering and therefore also demanding for frame conditions for future delivery. And uh, therefore, I think uh, we can, we can uh, have some gross possibilities and chances to better the forecasts. Forecasts are forecasts. Reality can be better or worse. And we try to make it better. Great. Yeah, um, right there, please, in the middle. Thanks, Anna. You were talking earlier about um, increased cooperation among the member states, particularly in the area of fiscal discipline, in order for the euro to survive. That fiscal discipline, for, for it to work, has to be enforced, which requires 
the member states to give up some degree of sovereignty. And because of that, I think a lot of people think that these measures have to put, be put to the people and have to be voted on through a referendum. My question to you is, do you agree that referendums will be required for there to be long-term cooperation in the fiscal area? And if so, will they pass? Because my impression is that the people generally are not in favor of such increased cooperation. Uh, perhaps this moment is the best one to make further steps in integration. Without crisis, you would be completely right. Uh, there would be uh, no discussion to make more fiscal discipline. Uh, that means uh, to discuss the corner points of our budget, to discuss the corner points of our public debt, of our deficit. That means to have also a discussion about uh, the level of taxes, and, and, and. Never this discussion would have taken place without this crisis. But on the other way around, this crisis now is a possibility to implement it. And now you are right. Um, discussion, is it a changing of treaty, which takes time? Or can we manage it, also a changing of treaty, very fast? What uh, the um, opinion of... Uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Sarkozy. Mm -hmm. Or can we make another form, an agreement which with, includes an obligation to act in this direction, which is my personal view. Uh, we will see. But no doubt we have to do it. And we have no time to discuss over months and years. And that's clear. That's a, a common awareness. And therefore, I'm optimistic that in the one or in another direction, but we will come to the solution and we will come to the result. OK, I think we have time for one more quick question. Yeah, in the back. Sorry, it's hard to see on that side. Over third row from the back, please, Nick. On the, on the end. If you could hold your arm up, he'll be able to see you. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I think the euro bond would go a long way to easing the fears of a domino type uh, contagion that the markets seem to be afraid of. But how would you entice some the, the the countries that pay the lowest rates, like Germany, the large economies, to to go for something like that? I, you mentioned the tiered, <clears throat> like uh, multiple tiers for that. Would that be determined by the rating agencies, or is there some other possibilities like uh, mandated um, <clears throat> like, like uh, education programs, uh, like apprentice programs, maybe technology apprentice programs? Or what kind of carrot would you throw the Germans to get them to go for that? When I understood stood correctly, uh, your question was, uh, how the differenti uh, differentiation be within euro bonds could work, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for bonds, US is paying, I think, 2% now. Uh, Japan, 2 or 3% with uh, debt of more than 200% of GDP, and Italy paying 7 or 8%. Why? OK, it's, it's a market. Yes, could be the answer. It is the market. But how to react on this fact? And therefore, and or Greece, Greece is it's, uh, climbing up 15 or 20 or, or percent. 
It's unaffordable. Unaffordable. And who has to pay the bill? The community has to help them. So, and therefore, the idea is to have also bonds, let's say the same interest rate like the United States, 2%, and then make an inner differentiation. Those who are in a better condition and have the sorrow than if they have euro bonds, they have to pay more interest than as triple A country. That's a sorrow, number one. And you can say, okay, you will have the best condition. And the others have worse conditions, perhaps 4% or 6%, but never 8%. Never 10%, never 15%, never 20%. That's, that's the main idea. And the second, the second contra-argument is, okay, if they have not to pay too much interest, they would be lazy in the um, reforms of um, and in, 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 their, in their duties to restructure uh, their frame conditions. And here I can answer with differentiated interest rate rates. You can force them to be active because they want to climb up in a better class and pay less interest rates. It's just an answer between those who say, yes, we need it for solidarity, and the others, they say, no, we, we, we don't like to pay more for them, and, and they are uh, becoming lazy in reforms. That would be a possible way in the middle. Perhaps it's only a, a contribution. Uh, I, I'm always, I'm coming from from the business, and business is always think, thinking very practical. And that's a practical way, and it's for discussion. And if someone is saying, uh, you are not right, okay. If the arguments are convincing, okay, discussion is coming to an end. But on the other way, I want arguments for my argument. Counterpositions positions or agreements. And perhaps it's a solution. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dr. Lytle for his comments. It's nice to hear optimistic perspective on Europe. Also, thanks again to the Austrian Consul General and to the Advantage Austria for our reception tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.